Hello and welcome to Honest Faith Conversations. As always, I am your co-host Miguel Covarrubias. And I am Kathy Covarrubias. And today, let's talk about Baby Driver. Um, yeah, so if you have not seen the movie yet, spoiler alert, uh, we will be talking about the movie. Uh, what? We will? <laughs> in uh, pretty much in its entirety, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, spoiler alert, if you have not yet gone to see that or rented it uh, from your red box or whatever. Yes. Um, we rented it from Google Play because I had a few extra credits. This is not sponsored by Google Play. <laughs> no. But hey, Google Play, if you want to give us a few extra credits, that'd be great. We could do some more reviews. Yeah. Uh, as it is right now, we're kind of like a lot of Netflix. So Yeah, we needed to expand our um, viewing uh, category. Yeah, our... our catalog. Our, Catalog, yeah. <laughs> so, um, moving on to our uh, review and summary of the movie. Um, so, quickly, my summary is: uh, you have a young man who is caught up in a crime syndicate and does the driving for them. Okay, that was a brief. Summary. That was so brief. <laughs> And honestly, just based on that, because that's what you told me, like, when you're like, this is what the movie's about, I was like, eh, like, I don't want to watch it. No, thank you. Um, And that's exactly what, well, if I'm going to keep it brief, just like you, that's how I would say it. I would, see, it's about a guy who listens to music. Okay. Music is a big part of his life, but he has to be part of this crime organization. And he's trying to get out. And right. he drives for them. I okay. added a little bit extra sprinkles on top for that. All right. <laughs> um, I really, uh, for my review here, is that I really feel like uh, this is uh, kind of a two-parter for Edgar Wright. I really love his movies. Uh, I really think that this is uh, Edgar Wright's um, love of music and of movie making put into one movie. I really feel like this is probably the movie that he wanted to make with Ant-Man. Um, but uh, since Disney kind of stepped in and, you know, he did kind of have a few uh, Disney jabs here and there. Yeah. Uh, if <laughs> they if they really are, could be, or if they are Disney jabs, uh, I think that they could be with, like, the Monsters, Inc. Uh, references and be like... Yep. Um, so I really feel that uh, this was an Edgar Wright movie. It was good. It was It was... Really good, in my opinion. I, I really enjoyed it. I think the car scenes were incredible. And the fact that he actually did uh, these actual stunts, practical stunts, rather than editing in cars, rather than editing in all this other stuff with computer-generated stuff. He just did it. And, and to time it to music. Time it to music, exactly. That was just brilliant, I thought. It was, uh, it was very mathematically satisfying mm-hmm. so yep and there was a lot of just like like one take sequences yeah like for the length of a song and you hard you don't ever see that anymore so that that's pretty amazing too um like i said like when you told me hey this is what i want to watch and and this is what it's about again i was like mm, okay i guess i'll watch it with you because like um crime movies don't do it for me Driving movies don't do it for me. Put them together, and I'm like, no. <laughs> well, me either, but, uh, you know, Edgar Wright it was my main draw mm-hmm. for this movie. Mm-hmm. So, And I did find it enjoyable. Um, I think I think what, what made it enjoyable for me was the music that was involved in it. The fact that everything was so timed out to the music, that's, that's what got me. I still... Yeah. Um, just car chase scenes just don't do it for me. I think they were. I think they were really well done. I think that. Uh, for... Oh, I'm not arguing that they weren't well done. They were yeah. just me personally, not a big fan. I could do without them. Yeah. Okay. I can understand and appreciate that. Yes. Um. So, uh, really, what I want to talk about here is uh, the one of the things that uh, we were doing while we were researching this movie a little bit was uh, uh, going into the in-depth style of Edgar Wright. And one of the things that uh, I think that he does brilliantly is that he really writes and directs introverted characters very well. 
And I think it's probably because he understands them pretty well. In, in this movie, uh, Miles, a.k.a. Baby, uh, is is a very introverted person. And you mm-hmm. can tell, you know, a lot from facial expressions with, uh, you know, his obsession with music and kind of shutting out the rest of the world with uh, his music, with his earbuds, uh, with uh, the sunglasses, which he has almost an infinite pair of mm-hmm. in his pockets, which I thought was hilarious. Um, to kind of the way that uh, he interacts with only his stepfather, with somebody that he, or not stepfather, his uh, foster parent. Yeah. Uh, that, uh, you know, it's... It's with there with him, he's animated with Deborah. He starts to come out of his shell a little bit and uh, he starts to uh, blossom a little bit there. And he's he is that character. And I think that that for me is what resonated a lot was because, you know, that's very much like me. I am a very introverted person Mm -hmm. that I keep a lot of what makes me an introvert or makes a lot of the good stuff inside and I don't really talk that much. And, uh, you can probably attest to this, even though I talk a lot on here. No, no, that's true. Like, um, I have had uh, like comments like, Oh gee, like, is he okay? Like, is he mad? No, he's not mad. He just likes to be by himself sometimes. Like (laughs) it's okay. Like he doesn't like, you don't have to be, like, you're perfectly happy just, like, observing the group and not necessarily, like, being part of our crazy conversations, especially in terms of, like, my family. <laughs> yeah. Well, and and that's the thing. Like, uh, uh, this is a very uh, Carl Jungian um, idea of both introvert and extrovert is that everybody has the capacity for both. But, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, that they're, they're both. Everybody is both at the same time. Yeah. And, Whereas, you know, I agree to that at at a point, I think some people are more introverted than they are extroverted. And for me, that's true. You know, I can play an extroverted person, especially when I have to. But for most of the time, it's it's not life giving to me. It doesn't energize me. What energizes me is reflection, is quiet reflection on things and, you know, being by myself and being with my trusted loved ones Mm -hmm. that understand me and love me. For who I am rather than, you know, playing this person, which is why for me it was so hard to be a youth pastor most, you know, days was that I had to play this extroverted person every day. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, especially when you live at a church that I, I had one church where I actually lived in the rectory. It was on the church campus. So I, I could never be off. I could never be not introverted. You mean we lived on it? Yes, we lived on it. <laughs> I was there too, remember? Well, I know. I'm, <laughs> I'm talking directly to the audience. Oh, okay, so, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Um, is, uh, you know, that uh, it was it was hard for me. And the, this is the thing that, uh, that extroverts get energy from socializing, from mm-hmm. just, you know, getting it out with other people and and not from quiet, introspective reflection which I just used uh, the same word to (laughs) describe it. But anyway, uh, you get the idea. And I I think that uh, uh, Miles, a.k.a. Driver, or Baby uh, Driver, I'm going back to uh, uh, the Ryan movie where he has a gold jacket and that has nothing to do with us. Yeah, now let's move on. Okay. (laughs) So anyway, Baby... Is clearly an introvert. Is clearly an introvert, and uh, you can see this with the way that he interacts with uh, his his crews. You can see the way that he interacts yeah. with uh, with the world around him, and uh, the letting letting Deborah in, and, and kind of showing that you know the pain really kind of does impact him, but it also that he he finds more life, more energy from. From these small interactions, from these reflective interactions that he has with other people. Uh, you can see this in his creative work with his uh, music, which is yeah. kind of wonky. It's almost like uh, Ross Geller's Soundscapes from Friends. It's Yeah, it's, well, I'm not a Friends fan. I have no, no idea I what know. you're talking about. But, um, but it is kind of weird. But it's also something that, like, if you're bored... And, like, you just needed to keep your mind occupied on something. Yeah. Then, I mean, that would 
I'd do something like that. I mean, I I used to make up like poems out of people's like phrases they would say. So I would I think that is is in the realm of what he was doing. Yeah, and that's why I write and podcast, and uh, that's what Honest Faith is about. It's my my uh, reflection and uh, introversion and getting that out to the world somehow. So. Mm-hmm. Um, that uh, you know he's really pulled into the struggle that with these uh, with the crews that he's with, especially with Bats and with uh, John Barenthal's character um, Griff, is that uh, he really has like this disconnect with people who who really want him to be extroverted. Yeah, and I think this is you know a, a thing that happens in the real world with everybody else with that. You know, they want you to be extroverted because the world is extroverted, that everybody, you know, interacts yeah, with so everybody what's else. Wrong with you? What's wrong with you? And that, why do you have your headphones in all the time? Why do you have, you know, why are you cut off from us? Yeah, you're clearly not paying attention. Exactly. When, you know, in fact, he is paying attention. He's just doing it in his own way. Mm-hmm. That, you know, he's doing, he's doing his own thing. And I think this is the main um, conflict throughout the movie is... With Doc, well, Doc kind of understands it. Well, but, yeah, because Doc has, I mean, he's been around with Doc since he was a kid. Yeah. Uh, but with Bats and with Griff, that they don't understand it. And, you know, it's really, it gets them and sets them off. Whereas Bats is more of a uh, psychopath and uh, Bats, or uh, Griff is more of a John douche. Barenthal douche mean guy. Yeah. Which he always plays. Yep. So. Like, uh, you know, in The Walking Dead, he was this yep. douche mean guy. Yep. And in Punisher, I'm guessing he's going to be this douche mean guy. But we'll talk about that next week. Yeah, so. we haven't quite watched it yet. So we can't say definitively at this point in time if he is or not. But Yes. And it came out this Friday. So we don't have to, we're not going to be rushed. We're not going to be, uh, you know, really having to, we're probably going to wa- start watching it this afternoon. So. Yes. Um. If it's too if it's too graphic, then we probably won't because we have a toddler, and yeah, we don't want him taking yeah, in no, too much like, of that stuff. We have noticed right that he has been he's definitely at that point in, in his life, like in his development, where he's taking in more of like TV shows. So we have been having to be a little bit more careful. So we've been watching a lot of The Wiggles recently. So if you guys want us to do a podcast about The Wiggles, oh, dear Lord, no. <laughs> I mean, Sesame Street is, is enough for me. That's where, you know, I draw. Well, I'll, I'll also watch Handy Manning with him because, you know, there's a little bit of that sexual tension with the uh, the hardware store lady and with uh, Mr. Lombard. See, and I can't Lombard. do Handy Manning because the stuff that he does, like, I'm like, that wouldn't work. That wouldn't work. Like, the <laughs> like the, <laughs> the builder in me is, like, screaming at him. I'm like, what? Why? Why are you doing it this way? But he learns a little bit of Spanish. Well, I guess maybe we can start him on Dora the Explorer. But that's way off but track, then, But then it's topic. like, what? Is that going to, like, show him that he can just run off with random monkeys? Like, no. <laughs> and, uh... A map that only sings, I'm the map. Yes. So, sorry. Uh, rabbit trail there. Um, <laughs> we'll bring it back. Baby driver. <laughs> yeah. Well, and this is, I mean, this is the struggle, was, is that he is, you know, he's kind of in his own world, but he, he's he's struggling to deal with, with what he does in his own way. Mm-hmm. You could tell that he doesn't really want to do this, that he's good at it, yes, but he doesn't really want to do this. He doesn't want to use what he does for ill yeah. Um, and uh, this this leads to more mistreatment by the community. You know, Bats can tell that he's not he's not fully in it. Um, well, Bats Buddy can tell doesn't that really he... feel that he's fully in it. Well, I I no, I would say that I know Buddy doesn't think that he Buddy knows he doesn't want to do it. Like Buddy knows Baby doesn't want to be involved, but Buddy also has been around Baby enough to know that he can like. He trusts him to drive. Yeah, well, like he he's good at it. Do, yeah, he he knows he's good at it, and he's gonna just mm-hmm. let him be until he, you know, things happen in the movie, and then Buddy's not so happy with Baby. And uh, you know, I think this is something that uh, we'll talk about more here in community. But I think this is something that most religious communities are extroverted communities mm-hmm. that they don't they don't treat introverts that come into that community really well and this is what happens that that becomes that big conflict 
with uh, communities and introverted people is that we we don't fit in well because they're extroverted. I mean, that's why they come together. That's why they join together in this place. That's why so many of them say, it's your duty to go to church on a Sunday morning. No, it's not. Our, our duty is to, to, to be loving and accepting to all. Mm-hmm. And I think that here, even though Baby didn't, didn't really join in with the communities, uh, with the groups, that he was still more accepting of them. He was like, okay, yeah. they're, they're human beings. Yeah, which is why he was so upset when one of them was taken care of for just making a simple mistake and admitting to it, too. Like, no, I know. And that's, but, you know, he also left fingerprints on the Subaru, so... Yeah, 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 yeah. I, exactly, like, sorry, I could go off about how I noticed that, too, and I was just like, no, no, what are you doing? <laughs> Kathy gets herself out of the movie really quickly when she doesn't want to watch it, apparently, so... Well, I just, when it comes to that kind of stuff, I'm like, why aren't you wearing gloves? Why aren't you wearing gloves? Why is nobody wearing gloves? Well, okay. Doc took care of that. He gave him gloves after that. Yeah, but how, but this was the last time. Like, how many... If you saw how much stack of cash he had, like, he clearly, clearly has been doing this for a long time. Yeah. All right. Based on that money. Anyway, based on that money, too, we can also tell, like, how much crime he's been doing since he was, like, what, 10? Because Doc said that he, he essentially, like roped him into it when he um, took one of his cars for a joyride. Yeah. And turned out that one of those cars had some merchandise in there that was pretty valuable. And so um, what happened was Baby essentially was forced into crime in order to not only protect his life, but then also to protect, like, the ones around him. And that might be why... We also see BB being so introverted is because he doesn't want to have more people into his life because he knows that that's more of a risk too. Well, not only that, it's uh, it's the reason why he decided to be arrested at the end of the movie. Uh-huh. You know, is that he didn't want to pull Debbie into that life. He didn't want to. He didn't want that anymore. Uh-huh. That, uh, but I think that this is what happens with introverts in those extroverted communities is they get pulled into a life that they didn't want. Yeah. Absolutely. And I do have to say that I found the way that he was pulled into like a life of crime mirrors a lot of what really happens in real life. This happens to a lot of people. They just end up getting stuck in a situation that they don't know how really they got involved in it. And in order to survive, in order to protect their family, in order to provide for their family, they end up having to now survive on a life of crime. Well, and see, this was also the difference between Bats and Buddy, Mm -hmm. was that Buddy was in it because he had to be. Um, As uh, Bats was pointing out, you know, he was, you know, in debt and stuff like this. Was as he was reading him, yeah, uh, so to say that. uh, But Bats was saying, "No, I this is this is my life. This is what I do. I I I do drugs to support my criminal habit." Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, that, uh, you know, for some people, yes, they're just, they're just bad, you know. (laughs) Well, yeah, I mean, that's, there's, you know, there is just naturally bad people, but the majority of the people who are in the life of crime don't want, they don't want to be in it. Yeah. They, and the, the bad thing is with the, especially in the United States, the way that our prison system works and the way our justice system works it's really hard once you end up going to prison to not go back into prison. The uh, res- is that res- recidivism. Yeah, the recidivism rate is so high. It's ridiculously high. And that's because, one, employers don't want to employ criminals. Yep. Even if it's something for something really small. Even if it is for, like, drug possession. And, two, the um, they also can't... The jobs that they can get once they get out of prison aren't good jobs. They're typically really low paying, like minimum wage jobs. They, they typically have really, really bad hours. So they just can't provide for themselves. And so they end up having to feel like they have to go back to the crime lifestyle in order again to provide for themselves. And this is something that, uh, you know, religious communities also fail at as well Mm -hmm. is that they don't, they don't want those people in their, 
their communities. Absolutely. And so it doesn't it doesn't give them an opportunity to connect with people who can help them, who can actually give them skills and uh, you know the, the the support support to really make it back out of that life. Absolutely. And this is why we we constantly see good people like Baby who really do have a moral compass. Like you see him like try to stop as many murders as he possibly can. Um, you see the good people like him forced into bad situations, forced to do bad things. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't agree with him killing bats. bats. <laughs> I feel like that could have gone a different way. However, um, it was driven by emotion is what I can boil down to. Oh, by the way, he killed somebody. He should have gotten more time in prison. Yeah, but he also killed somebody who was likely going to kill the uh, lady, uh, the uh, teller that yeah. uh, was at the post office. Yeah. So I think, in a way, he was trying to save her life. Well, he's trying to save more people's lives because he knows how, I mean, he's witnessed how crazy Bats is. Yeah. Like, for for goodness sake, like, he, he killed a convenience store owner over gum. He could have, and, and just like what Buddy said, he's like, you could have just grabbed it like (laughs) you could have just stolen it like any anybody else you didn't have to step over that line and i think that maybe baby saw that he really did need to get out of the crime life because he realized that it it wasn't just robbing banks it wasn't just robbing from these these people who have you know way too much money now it was hurting like the common people. people yeah yeah well, especially with that uh, last job before he was straight with mm-hmm. Doc, was uh, you know he saw Bats kill the uh, the uh, armored truck driver. Yeah. So. Yeah, for no reason. I mean, I do know, a, like working at a bank. I mean, and you can see this too. Like as you're driving by, you can see those armored people. Like, there's a reason why they're wearing. Um, the bulletproof vests. There's a reason why they, you can visibly see the guns that they carry because that's a big deterrent. They want people to know, Hey, I'm, you know, I have this on me. I mean business. Yep. (laughs) Leave me alone. (laughs) And to be honest, they usually don't have all that much money because banks don't carry a lot of uh, as much money as people think that they do anymore. Oh no. I mean, they don't need to. It's only like a, uh, enough to cover what uh, estimated transactions are going to happen that day. Yeah. Yeah. It's so it's to be honest, it's really not all not that worth it. In my opinion, speaking from somebody who used to be in banking, it's not, it's just not worth it. <laughs> it's not worth it to go to prison to try no, to rob a bank. <laughs> no, what you're saying. to get like $2,000 at most. No, it is not worth yeah, it. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> I mean, that's also like, why are you robbing a convenience store? Because convenience stores, you get maybe like a couple of hundred bucks and that's it. Yes, exactly. It's not. Well, and this is, this is the thing is that, uh, that as you were saying was that the recidivism rate is the reason why they do this is because they feel Mm -hmm. like they have to, Yeah. that they can't, they can't make do on some bill or something. And and there's so much pressure that's being put on them to live up to that, Mm -hmm. that, you know, they feel like they need to turn to this. And I think we talked about this a little bit in, um, our episode on the Ozark yeah, uh, was how the economy can drive somebody to do this. Mm-hmm. And in Baby's case, it wasn't the economy because he was a kid. I mean, he didn't need money. Yeah, he was, <laughs> you know, acting out of a place of pain. Yeah. Of, you know, own of personal fear. torment. Of fear. Yeah, because his par- both of his parents were dead. They were killed in that car crash. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, he didn't have anybody else to look after him. So he's just going to do his own thing. What makes him happy? Yeah. was driving, so. And I think that for him as well, because he was so young and because he actually had never been arrested for anything, he did have, he did have an easy out, you know? Like, he did try. I mean, he was working as a pizza delivery guy, you know, probably getting minimum wage. The tips aren't that great. So, you know, he, he at least was trying and he is one of the lucky ones that could do that. Probably below minimum wage. Most uh, delivery mm-hmm. drivers, uh, it's it's all, they make almost the same as waiters. That they still have to pay for all of their own gas. They still have to pay for 
um, all these other things. And uh, more expensive insurance. Exactly. And uh, most people, most insurance companies will not tell you that you need uh, different insurance for that because you probably don't tell your insurance company what you do for a living. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you do need more expensive insurance. You do need all of these other things to kind of cover you while you're doing this. And uh, you're making what a waiter makes, which is tips. And yep. most people don't tip their pizza delivery person. Yep. Or if they do, it's just like rounding up to the nearest dollar. So it's really not all that much. But The but, moral of the story <laughs> is tip your pizza delivery guy. Tip, er, tip the people that you should be tipping is what. Exactly. <laughs> And I, it's really hard to to weigh your options, I guess, when you're in that scenario because it's, especially with somebody like Doc who clearly has like reach, even into the police. Like he he was like, no, yeah, those those feds were my feds. Like so, he clearly has a lot of reach, and it probably intimidated Baby to to feel like he had to continue no matter what. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think that uh, he really was kind of forced into this life uh, of being this person, of being of being the driver for this group. And you could definitely tell, though, that he was the more moral out of all of them. He was the one that was trying trying to stop the murder. I wouldn't say moral. I would say good hearted. Okay. Um, because I think there's a big difference between the two. Can you explain the difference? Um, the difference is, uh, moral would be a, a, uh, constructed morality, a structured kind of, um, socially acceptable moral code that, uh, is, um, at large, this is what everybody agrees on, Mm -hmm. that this is moral. Okay. Whereas good hearted is more focused on hurting people or loving people rather Mm -hmm. is uh, accepting people for who and what they are is loving them for who and what they are and uh, doing your best to make sure that you don't hurt anybody and that everybody else doesn't hurt other people on your behalf as well okay yeah and he's definitely good-hearted and the majority of the people in the prison system are there for drug-related crimes yeah and most of them, it has to do with possession. So they were carrying drugs that chances are they were going to use themselves, not harming anybody else. And yet, they are sucked into that cycle. Well, and I think that uh, Baby did a good job of staying away from that stuff. Oh, even yeah. though, you know, we have no idea. But, you know, he was with other people who did. And so... Well, the fact that he, like, he made a point to distance himself, like, during, yeah. like, the meetings, too. Like, he was like, you guys, you guys do the heavy lifting. I'm just the driver. Like, you guys are doing the crime. I'm just the accessory. And I think that he probably did that to protect himself. Yeah, a bit. <laughs> and to be honest, I've done that, too. Like, in situations where, like, um, where I feel like people are like talking about I don't know I just get bad vibes from people like in certain groups Mm -hmm. and I kind of like have an idea of like the type of people they may be and so in order to protect myself like I may still be like a part of the group but I'll step back a little bit to where I don't throw myself wholeheartedly into the group because I don't want to be involved in whatever craziness they're involved in all right so um where do we go from here? Uh, really, I think that uh, I think this is what I was talking about with uh, religious communities is is that acceptance of all. And I think mm-hmm. that this is something that has a lot to do with uh, an introvert versus an extrovert view is that an introvert view will see that being being good hearted, as I put it, is much more important than being moral. Mm -hmm. is that, um, you know, you see kind of people's motivations for for what they do, why they do what they do. Mm -hmm. And you really want to make sure that they feel comfortable within the communities that you're in because you know how uncomfortable it is for you as an introvert. And I think that this so much of uh, so much learning can come from those those introverts in those communities, Mm -hmm. in those 
in those extreme extroverted communities, if you listen to the introverts and listen to to the advice that they give, and when they're opening their mouths, they're they're giving you something good because they've thought about it for a long time before yeah, they actually open their mouths. They processed it, and unfortunately, I've seen this happen. Like people, like somebody who is introverted will finally speak their minds, and people will just poo poo them. Like whatever, they're not really part of the group. They really don't know what's going on. Well, I think this, I, I, I ran up against this a lot when I was a, a youth minister was that, uh, you know, people didn't want to listen to me. People thought I was angry at them or I hated them or whatever most of the time because most of the time I was quiet. I didn't, I didn't uh, say things. I tried to make a point more of speaking up during meetings and mm-hmm. speaking up during things was because that's what people wanted from me. But, you know, it's, I wasn't doing that because it was who I was. Yeah. I was doing that because that's what people wanted from me. Yeah. And I think that so much of the time, that's what we do with with introverted people as a society as a whole, is that we push them uh, into trying to be circle pegs rather than square pegs, you know? Yeah. There's that, uh, you know, we're trying to push them into these holes and it's really shaving bits of themselves off uh, when you're pushing them into these holes. Well, and I wonder too, like... Because for those introverts that are forced to participate, who are forced to, to like, go outside of their comfort zone, I wonder how many times, because I, I don't know, because I'm not, I'm more of, like, an in-between. Like, I do like being extroverted, but then I also, I need, I need to just escape from people. Like, I need to hide for just a moment <laughs> sometimes, too. I wonder... Like how many, it must be pretty common for introverts when they're put into that situation like you were, where you were forced to speak up a little bit more, forced to participate a little bit more, where you might have said or done something that you didn't truly like believe or think, or maybe you like said something that was more of a mistake and you thought about it later and it was like, oh wait, no, it should have been more about this because you weren't given that time to process it and to think about it like you normally would have. Exactly. And I would say that happens a lot. (laughs) Um, that happened to me a lot. I feel like a lot of the times that people people took things that I said the wrong way because I was forced to say something. Mm-hmm. And uh, without having to think about it for it first and without formulating it first, that it comes out poorly. Yeah. And uh, and so I think that uh, religious communities could do would do well, would be wise to listen to their introverts, to listen to the quiet ones in their groups. Because if there's any left. Yeah, if there's any left, if they haven't been all been forced out. And usually it's the extroverts who end up on the church boards. It's the extroverts who end up being pastors or priests. If uh, they're pastors or priests who are actually doing more of the uh, interpersonal work, they mm-hmm. usually are more extroverted. Uh, there are, are a lot of uh, pastors or priests uh, who are not, who are introverted, Mm -hmm. who really take to heart a lot of those things that people say and with their reflection and everything else like that, it destroys them. Mm -hmm. Then so they end up with these mental illnesses like anxiety disorders, with depression disorders, with with a whole lot of host of other things that they don't seek help for because of that that struggle of being an introvert in an extroverted world. Mm -hmm. And I think that once we allow people to be people accept them for who they are rather than forcing this this moralistic code that we have on them then you know we're really then doing the work of the gospel Mm -hmm. and this week uh I, i wrote about this in my most recent blog post was that i really feel that uh the moralism moralism society has taken over gospel within the church. And I think that uh, this is my clear differentiation between a moral person and a good person is that uh, Jesus hung out with all of these people that, that society saw as bad. He hung out with uh, prostitutes, with tax collectors, with all of these other things. And they called with Jesus the sick. <laughs> yeah. Well, and who were uh, considered to be bad as well. They called Jesus a, uh, a glutton and a drunkard because of it. And they saw Jesus as immoral. Mm -hmm. But really, when you read the Gospels, you see that Jesus was a good person. And that their whole idea of morality was completely upside down. 
and I think that this this movie does a great job of illustrating this was that was that baby while being a good driver definitely probably didn't wasn't very moral mm-hmm. in in the sense of the larger whole of the bigger picture of what the society deemed him to be of what society deemed to be moral and I mm-hmm. think that this, so much the church has decided this is moral that you have to be right you have to be moral before you can come to God before God will forgive you or any of this other stuff. And that's completely replaced the gospel Mm -hmm. where the, as the gospel was, you can come as you are, you're accepted as you are. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter who you love, that you are still accepted, that you are still loved here in this community. And this community is a community of outcasts of people who are seen as immoral, as seen as the scum of the earth. And, and I think that selective, Selective forgiveness and this moralism uh, has replaced the gospel mm-hmm. completely. Yep. And once you do that, you've become a completely different church. You're worshiping something else. You're worshiping power and or money. And I think that t- in today's society, it's quite evident that that's there. That you have uh, the religious right who is who is obsessed with just being right Mm -hmm. and they've made a religion out of the republican party whereas god doesn't belong to either political party god belongs to everybody Mm -hmm. and and i think that uh you know without getting into too much politics because that's not what our show is about totally talk about (laughs) we go down a real big rabbit hole if we did that exactly um is that we are that we are as a church replacing the best part of ourselves with the worst part of ourselves. Yep. And Jesus had a lot to say about that. In fact, if you go back and read the gospels, like I've been doing and I'm, I'm in my writing process here is that Jesus had a lot to say against those who, who were all about power and wealth and money and about being seen as wise in front of other people rather than actually getting your hands dirty and doing the work and helping people out especially in the society and trying to help people come back into society after a prison stint or after going off to war. I think this is something that, I mean, that we've talked about in other episodes before is that the religious communities are doing a a really poor job of doing this, is helping people transition back into society, giving them the skills to cope with the stuff that they had to see, the stuff that they had to deal with. Yep, and giving them the tools to actually go back into society as a functioning citizen. Exactly. And so that, you know, they don't continue with this recidivism rate. They don't they don't uh, have these huge PTSD disorders. And, well, I, that was a little repetitive because it is post-traumatic stress disorder. disorder. That's okay. <laughs> so, um, you know, is trying to help people. And I think that, I think that once... I really feel that the church in itself, the Western church needs to really take a big hard look in the mirror is to look at themselves and say, has my moralism replaced the gospel? And if so, they need to really reconsider what they're doing as a church, because that's not what the church's goal was. The church's mission in itself was to help people. Mm -hmm. No strings, no agendas was just to love people that's it and that's that honestly that's what made me want to come to christianity that's what that's what makes me want to be a christian is 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 that is i want to help people i don't want to force them into some weird moral code i don't want to do that i want people to know that they're loved and that with me they can be helped that i am a person that's going to help them and not do it with some strings attached or that they have to be a certain way before they can get that. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I was on my soapbox for a little bit. Nope, that's okay. Sometimes I enjoy us uh, just sitting back and uh, watching you <laughs> jump on your soapbox. I've gone on my soapbox plenty of times too. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, wrapping this all up, uh, our feedback schedule for the next few weeks. Next week we're doing The Punisher. Uh, the week after that we're probably going to be doing Broad Church Season 3. Uh, if it's on and we can get through it in enough time uh, before that 
uh, one. Mm -hmm. Then after that, I think we're going to do a Christmas special. Is that for uh, the month of December that we're going to be discussing Christmas movies and Christmas specials of television shows, like maybe a Doctor Who Mm -hmm. Christmas special, because that would be fun, Uh, and stuff like that. So we will be talking about Christmas stuff. So And hopefully eventually Godless on Netflix, because I'm kind of excited about that too. Yes. Yes, but that's not on the schedule yet, but I want it to be. <laughs> yes, it's, it will be there after Christmas, I'm sure. We can yes. catch up on some of the other things while we're doing short yes. Christmas special episodes. <laughs> Um, so, uh, if you have anything to say about those or about today's episode or any of our past episodes for that matter, give us a call at... 720-372-3879. Leave us a voicemail and we may even use you and you're on one of our future podcasts and we'll talk about uh, what you want to talk about. Yeah. So join the conversation in that way in uh, giving us a call and saying, you know, you know, I really want to talk to this point that she's had about recidivism or something like that. And uh, just, you know, leave us a voicemail and we'll be like, hey, OK, yeah, well, let's we'll engage in discussion with you on that. Yep. Or if you would like to um, leave a comment on um, our Facebook or on Twitter, um, if you want us to read it um, out loud on the podcast, let us know. We'd be happy to share your thoughts out loud if you'd like to share it with the um, audience that we have. Yeah, you can direct message us on Facebook and or Twitter Mm -hmm. uh, if you would like. Both of those places, we're Real Honest Faith. So Twitter, it's at Real Honest Faith. On Facebook, it's Facebook.com backslash Real Honest Faith. We're also on Reddit. We're also on Tumblr. We're also on Google Plus. But really, who who goes to Google Plus? We have an email, don't we? I don't think we do have an email. Honest Faith Convos at gmail.com. You can also email us. Yeah. Um, I haven't really gotten a whole lot of emails, uh, you know, in that email box. So I, I, I do check it every day, but I get like two emails. Yeah. So if you email him or us, we will read it. I'm more likely than not to, <laughs> to see that. So, um, yeah, join the conversation in that way. Also, you can check out the website. Our our email address is on the website as well. So, uh, thehonestfaith.com. You can read the blog that where I talked about moralism versus the gospel uh, this week. Uh-huh. Um, you can also buy my book to use it as uh, fire kindling or to prop up a leg of a table. Yep. Um, or to uh, throw it at your enemies. Yes. Um, I am currently recording the... Uh, audiobook version of that so uh, that should be out in a few weeks as well and so those are most of our announcements and uh, so anyway we thank you so much for listening we thank you so much for being with us on this if you like what you hear please share with other people please let them know that hey we we actually kind of talk about some cool stuff in pop culture yep Um, Um, subscribe too so you don't miss an episode exactly Uh, you don't have to listen to all of our episodes but it would be nice Yeah, I mean, clearly, if there's going to be stuff you haven't seen yet, you don't have to watch it. You're not going to hurt our feelings. Or watch it. I mean, listen to it. You don't have to listen to it. Yeah. Um, And you can also uh, go and support us on Patreon, because, you know, we do have one. Christmas is coming. Exactly. Uh, Hint, hint. (laughs) We would like like a new computer to be able to have better sound. That would be good. Mm -hmm. So... Um, Anyway, with all that being said, we invite you to come and join the conversation. Bye.